Okay, hopefully Nicole can see the PDF. And that will be here. And now just do your option. Okay, full screen option. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody, welcome to STAT 701. Okay, maybe I need to turn my microphone back on. Horrible echoing sounds. All right, so today we do not have our projector. <laughs> Why? I'm not sure. Um, there. Okay, that projector is warming up. Um, okay, so in the meantime, um, our speaker today is Sam, or is it Samuel? Either one. Uh, okay. Either one. Okay, so. Um, well, either of those are easier for me to pronounce than the Chinese name. Uh, sorry, I, I really need to take a class. Uh, so this is still warming up. Um, I will just mention uh, next week we're going to have um, Andrew Crone back. Some of you may know Andrew, just graduated, so he's at Max Point. He's going to come back and give an overview on some of the exciting work that they're doing there, opportunities for summer internships, so you know, if everyone's time to think about that now, so hopefully uh, come see the presentation and I understand that there will be free food afterwards. It's appealing to graduate students, but hopefully we'll get <laughs> some more of you. Uh, okay, so Sam is going to go ahead now that we have our screen and I'm going to see if I can get the permutations on the lights to Okay. All right. I guess I can stand now. Okay. Hello, everyone. So, uh, thank you for attendance. So, first, I have apologized because I'm going to make you suffer from a total, totally non an hour from now on. So, first, I want to make some inter. Thank you, suffer. Okay. <laughs> so. First, I, I want to have, uh, interpret some terms in the title because my work is essentially follows the work by Professor Jensen Fan. So this high dimensional, a uh, high ultra high dimensional is the term they use in their paper. But actually, recently I figured out in their published one, they, their method cannot deal with this situation. So, so but here I was still talking about this uh, situation in my framework. But actually, there are some one of my theorems will be problemat problematic, uh, matching. If in this situation, so I probably will just uh, skip the theorem in the talk. Now let's get started. This is the uh, outline of today's talk. First, I will do some introduction to the concrete setting of the high dimensional problem and the ultra high dimensional problem. Then I will switch to about the motivation of my method and uh, the theory of the method. And then I will do a, a more inter intuitive comparison between the sure in sure independent screening, which is the method proposed by Professor Jin Fan, and my method. And finally, is a simulation study. So let's start first. Uh, so first, let's consider the classical linear model y x y equal to x times theta plus epsilon, where epsilon is some normal error, and x is the NIP matrix represent our sample matrix. Each row corresponds to a uh, observation, and each column corresponds to a covariate. Theta is our co co is our coefficient, and y is the response factor. Now, in the classical setting, when p is less than n, we can find the ordinary least square estimator for beta by solving the following optimizing optimization problem. Uh, then, by solving this equation, it gives us a nice form, like look like this. However, if p is greater than n, then the matrix x transpose x, x transpose x is not invertible, which means that there is no unique solution to this optimization problem. So, so by using the uh, ordinary least square estimator, is noisy because there is no unique solution. Based on this information, people cut cut the dimension into two phrases. One is the low dimension, when p is equal to the small n, which means that p over n goes to zero. And one is the high dimension, if p over n goes to not goes to zero, as to some probably positive positive value, or probably infinity. So, I'm oh, sorry. So in this case, if all the p factors, if all the betas are non-zero, so we have like, for example, we have p 
uh, we have p elements, they are all non-zero, then this problem is not estimable because we only have n observations, which is smaller than p. So in, the, in this case, people add the uh, sparsity assumption. That is, uh, most co coefficients of beta are equal to zero, except, a small, except for a small portion, denoted as the true model, which means that although I have, I have a large model, but most of the coefficient of beta is equal to zero, and only a small portion is not zero. In this case, the original estimation problem becomes both estimation and the variable selection, because we have to select these non-zero betas. Now, so the challenges for the high-dimensional data. So since, since now it gains the uh, aspect of variable selection, the first is uh, also the challenge for variable selection. Be because our, the, the model state size is 2 to the power of p, which will lead to an np hard for searching through the whole model space. So many classical methods like AIT, BIT, or best subset or all greedy algorithm is not the like, optimization over, over the whole model space. The second one, the predictors could be highly correlated with each other, which makes, for example, some non-zero axis could be highly correlated with some true variables. Then it makes it harder to identify these true, var true variables. The third, the non-zero beta will probably decay to close to zero and below the noise level, which means that your signal noise ratio will be very low. Then it's harder for you to find some true variables uh, within a very large noise level. So in order to deal with this problem, considerable methods have been proposed for high-dimensional data. So this is just a brief summary. There are more, plenty more problem, uh, methods. The first is kind of a penalized likelihood method. So typically, people add an L1 norm penalized on the original uh, optimization question. It's like you put a LQ ball, you restrict your beta in our LQ ball, then do the optimization, find the best beta to a question. Like that, lasso, lasso is for the L1 norm, the scale is not L1, but some, some norm between 1 and 2. And uh, besides the penalized likelihood, density selector was proposed by Professor uh, Kandas and the first top. This is an, another, uh, it, this was from the uh, point of view of the uh, compressed sensing. They do not minimize the likelihood, but minimize the norm of beta, our norm of beta. It's like they put, uh, so allow your beta, so once your beta is small enough, uh, the area of prediction is small enough, they choose the beta that can minimize, the, that has the least L1 norm. So for Bayesian, we can use some shrinkage prior, but I'm not actually partial and uh, Second slam, I'm not very familiar with that, but I'm going to learn on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for, but there are some problems with these methods. The first for lasso, there's a very strong condition called the irrepresentable condition was uh, for the model consistency proposed by Professor Yubin. So uh, as they provide as they proved under this under their sense of model consistency, this uh, irrepresentable condition is both sufficient and necessary. But uh, their cons model consistency is very strong. Their, uh, their sense is you not, you not only you need to select the non-zero beta, but also the sign of the beta of your estimator must be the same as the true beta. Like not only you choose the non-zero beta, but also your sign should be the same, cannot be reversed. That's why they need to add such a strong condition. But in our case, we we can reduce this, this condition because we don't need a set, such a strong consistency sense. Oh, also, there is a con constraint. Your p cannot be larger than e to the power of n to the power of psi, where, where psi is less than 1, which means that your log p over n should always go to 0. And for density selector, they, are, they require the uh, uniform Okay, never mind. UUP assumption is hard to satisfy in dim high dimensional case. And also in their original paper, there is no theoretical guarantee of the model selection um, consistency. Now for scale, which the method is proposed by Professor Chen in 2004, it cannot deal with the high dimensional data because it requires P to the power 3 over n goes to 0. 
Uh, another problem is the, is the computation cost. The last algorithm uh, and the linear programming uh, will face problems when the uh, when the data scale is very high. Also, I think linear programming will not provide a sparse solution to original problem. And for even for the so now that people will use the coordinate wise decent algorithm, but even this algorithm will still face some problems when P is huge. Therefore, we, we met some new challenges here. That first is uh, if P equal to has this expression and when psi is greater than one, greater or equal to one, which means that a lot of P over N will probably not go to zero. The second one is um, how to reduce the computation cost. So, sorry. So in this, in based on this information, we can cut our dimensionality into this new uh, categories. So for between high dimensional, high dimensional, we can uh, separate uh, ultra high dimensionality when you when your log p over n is go to non-zero when n going to infinity. So now, so actually, there are more serious problems in fan in the published version of fan paper. Their their proof um, actually is not correct. Then. so they can actually they finally they cannot deal with this problem and uh, uh, also as provide as proved by Professor Yu in another paper that any penalized method cannot achieve uh, the minima in a sense of minimax rate they can only achieve the cosine less than one they cannot achieve the so for cosine equal to one there is you cannot use the penalized method to for for the model selection consistency. So a possible solution to deal with when Kasai greater than one is to separate the estimation problem from the selection problem. That is, we do a two-stage for our selection. For first, we for, for the first step, we don't we do not consider the selection problem. Uh, we don't we do not con consider the estimation problem. We just do the variable selection in the first in the first stage. We try to use some simple method to reduce our original dimensionality to a Relatively small one, and the second step is use the, use those like low dimensional method to deal with the small model you selected. So this uh, strategy can correspond to the select first, bit after uh, strategy. And uh, our classical variable selection method is fit first, select after as, as we learned in in the class linear model. So there are still some argument between these two structures. I think I think Bayesian will always hold for this one, right? Fit first, just like after, because we can find the um, model selection uncertainty. Because if you select first, there is no way for you to estimate the. Sorry. So if, uh, if you combine these two steps together, then you need to contribute uh, to the zero that the min max rest would be uh, would, would be not possible to deal. Yeah, with I mean. High. That minimum max rate is for the penalized likelihood. So probably there is some method not based on the penalized likelihood. Then it's possible for you to do this. Right? You mean the in which which paper? You mean the 1994 uh, Donahoe paper, or mean the professor professor Yu Bing? They I think they they find the minimum rate for the LQ ball, which where they they constrain their beta in LQ ball. Then they find the minimax rate, and uh, so their method is based on the penalized yeah. Okay. So then we denote the first step as oh, I, actually my method cannot deal with this situation. Also, <laughs> so, uh, so we denote the first step as a variable screening, and uh, now considerable screening methods have been proposed. Uh, the most famous are the sure independent screening, safe and strong rules. Let's come come to the uh, these three methods. These three methods are all based on the marginal correlation. So if we let W denote the marginal correlation, which is defined as x transpose ten y, if x and y are standardized. Now, sure, independent screening select a model or select the submodel in this way. If we order the, the the marginal correlation according to their absolute value, if we want to select a Size D model, we just choose the largest covariance with uh, covariance with the largest correlation, 
marginal correlations and DGVs in some form. And for states, they selecting the variables satisfy, satisfy the uh, some they use some threshold to cut on the value of the marginal correlation and throw away the the rest. And the strong rule is the same. They choose another threshold for choosing this WI. So as as um, proved in Professor Tibrani's paper, the strong rule will el eliminate more variables than safe. But all of these three methods are based on the marginal correlation. You see, if my true variable is marginally uncorrelated, uncorrelated with y, or or um, slightly correlated, not very high correlated with y, then these methods will not will not reduce the dimension e efficiently. For example, if wi equals zero for some true value, you have to you have to select all the variables in your sub model, so it cannot actually reduce any dimensionality in this case. So since things these methods are similar, we will focus on sure independent screening in our in today's talk. So we talk about the assumptions for SIS and some problem of ISS. Then we will come back to our method. So this is the most important assumption for SIS. So recall the linear model we defined before. And for simplicity, we assume x, y are centered. Then there, there will not be a constant term in this model. And we assume variance x, i equals 1, because they are standard. Now we define a z equal to the, the square root of the sigma, where sigma is the covariance matrix. So we know if x is a multinomial, uh, this, if x follows a multinomial distribution, then z should follow a independent, it should be independent uh, normals, because you just because you uh, time this covariance matrix with. So the covariance matrix of sigma of z will be identity matrix. Then in, in that case, um, we can you can ver uh, you can verify the concentration property holds for any sub matrix of z. So that's why they propose this concentration property. And they can conjecture that a, a wide range of um, of distribution should follow this concentration property. At least uh, it, should, it is true for multinomial, where well, x is multinomial. So this is a condition for SIS. So this is a, their dimension assumption. So in their published paper, in the original preprint paper, there is no constraint on the side, but in their published paper, they put a constraint on that. But their way to, to derive that condition is very odd. Actually, it's not correct. Uh, sorry. So also, second, they, are, they assume that they should have the spherically symmetrical distribution. So to see if, if we can see if x is a multinomial, oh, sorry, multivarinomial, then you, when you multiply some sigma here, it will make z to independent, which is a spherically symmetrical distribution. So we know if x is, is kind of elliptically distributed, then z will always be spherically symmetrical distribution. And also, they should follow the concentration property. So all the conditions. There's one I want to comment on is this one. So the, the, this one is a very, very strong condition they made on their method. So here they said for any variables, for any true variables, the marginal correlation should be very high. So it's a it's a little odd because you are proposed a method to screen to to screen the variables from the <coughs> marginal correlation. Then you assume your true variables are highly correlated with the marginal. Because it's like you are you are you are asked to prove that the television, the high high you should, you are, sorry you are asked to prove that uh, the to choose the high quality television can just from the high price. Then you assume that usually high price television will, will have high quality. Then you just choose that. So there's if you make that such condition, there's nothing to prove because you. You are telling us that the true uh, the true variables are always highly correlated with y. So it's a very 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 strong condition. That's true. Okay. But you mean by highly correlated? The variable seems to be greater than zero, so I interpret that as just saying. Yeah, but their beta i could go to correlations can't go to zero. Yeah, the beta i could go to go to zero. But if you if you stick the beta i high, then your sig signal and the noise ratio will also be very very good. So I will I will give you some simulation example to show. So typically, if if there is no constraint like there is a constant here, 
this value will go to zero. For if there is no such component there, if you just simulate some X with highly correlated covariance, and so no matter no matter whether whether X I is a true graph or not, all this correlation will go to, go to some similar law, similar similar level that down to zero. There is a speed like n, n to some power one over n to some power. So in this case, they made this constraint to make the since all of them, most of them will get down to zero, and if they are some of it, like uh, the true graph have some constant here, which which means that you are like can uh, for the true graph can stand out from the others. Sorry. So. Uh, the index for columns or rows? Columns. Yeah, rows is observation. So there should be a Oh, sorry, it's just a y. Okay, so for that quantity, if x are independent, then that should be 1. Uh, yeah, you're right. So if x are independent, then. So yeah, so I, I, I will, yeah, I will show that in the following page. So this is one simulation result. So here, our model has 1,000 variables of covariance, and the observation is 100, and the true number of the true variables is 5. Now in this setting, we simulate 500 times, and the record is the minimum size we have to select in order to capture the true model, and the plot is a histogram. So in this graph, the sigma, the covariance is identity. So we see most, we, uh, like if we select a model less than 100, still we have a large probability to capture the true model. But for that picture, if the correlation raised to 0.3, you know, most likely if we, the model, if, in order to capture the true model, we have to choose all the variables, which is not desirable. So if we choose a small model size here, it will be a very, very small probability to capture the whole true model. How big are the effects? Uh, about two. Two standard deviations. And what do you mean, the unique coefficient? Yeah, well, well, uh, there's it's a five true that. thing, right? Yes. And they're, they have an absolute magnitude of around two? You, uh, you mean the betas? Yeah. The betas. It's two. I think that's a two. Okay. And the sigma has a variance of one. Okay. And x size also have a variance of one, as we specified. Yeah, I should I should write that. So which is very bad even when the correlation is just a point three. Okay, now let's come back to so as so it, so this means that so in this case actually the condition the that the previous condition here is not satisfied for this case, I will demonstrate why it was not satisfied in the following section. So now let's come back to our other original original least square. As we specified before, the least square estimator is noisy because there are there's no unique solution. But it doesn't mean that all the solutions are bad, right? We can probably we can choose an optimal one for us to do the variable screening procedure. So here we proposed our uh, least square estimator in this form, and prove that this term will do much better work than any correlation-based method. So first, one observation, first x times x transpose is an n by n matrix. It's not a p by p. So when p is greater than n, this term is inversible. So which means that the, uh, so this is well defined. Now, also when n is tiny, the computation for beta high is almost uh, linear with p. So the computation cost is also very low. Now if we multiply x in the left hand side, it will give you y, which means that this is actually this is one least square solution to the or original optimizing problem. Okay, now we come to the theory of the theory of the least square estimator. So So from this term, you know, it make it minimize the original optimization problem, right? So it's a it's a least square solution. 
So you see your original formula is y minus x beta squared. So the minimum value you can choose is 0. So in this case, my x beta hat is equal to y. In this case, beta hat minus y squared equal to 0. So this actually this achieves the minimum minimum value of that optimization problem. You can make up lots of estimators that have x beta hat equal to y in the therefore. Yeah, so I mean, this is the optimal one I made. I'm going to show why this works works better in the following. Oh, so. Does the definition of the square? So I, I guess the definition of the least square, I'm oh, sorry, is just a. Uh, Why it doesn't work? Yeah, so any term that can minimize this this uh, object function called the least square estimator. So I guess, so you see the minimum value can choose is 0, and um, I have verified that my beta had also choose 0. So this is. I, so I'm willing to believe that it's a least square solution, but I don't think it follows from that last line that you wrote there. I don't, I don't think x beta hat equals. Yep. Okay. Actually, it's right, right, like a sandwich estimator with some weird filtering matrix in there that will satisfy that equation, but it won't be the least squared. There are a lot of least squared square, square solutions when in the high dimensional problem. So this is just one of them, not not the unique one. I I will, I will okay. So can, can can I go first because I was going to show the deri derivation of LS, then you will understand why I choose that form, and you I, I think after this one you could totally agree why I said it's a least square. So I'm going to show the any the inspiration to propose this least square estimator. The first is from the point view of the rigid regression. So this is a term for rigid regression. We know there is a unique solution to rigid regression even in the high dimensional case. Actually, there is some. I think there are some professors in NC State. They prefer some method based on rigid regression to do a screening, but they didn't provide any theoretical guarantee for re rigid to work well. I guess that's probably because this term doesn't interpretable. You know, I mean, it's hard to deal with theoretically for rigid. So here, R is the tuning parameter. Now, if we let the R go to zero. It will give us one least square solution in this way. So this is the original one we familiar with. This plus means the more generous inverse, generalized inverse of the matrix. But however, this term, this form is difficult to deal with because there's I don't think there is any theory in random matrix a theory to deal with large matrix with a parallel inverse, par, uh, more parallel inverse. So by some algebra magic, the one can show the following equation holds. The ridge actually equal to that form, and if then if you let r goes to zero, it will lead you to my estimator. So actually, my estimator is another form of the ridge of the least square from the view of a more parallel inverse of inverse generalized inverse. So this is one way to derive derive my estimator. A second way is to derive it from the view of the compressed density. So to find a beta is essentially to solve a linear equation. If we eliminate, if we omit, ignore the error part, it's just a y equal to x times beta. So to solve a linear equation, typically we just need to. So, uh, sometimes this equation will not solvable. For example, your x is very long, your y is very long. So that's why for this square, we multiply x transpose in the left hand side, and make it a projected version of the linear equation. Then this will solvable when n is greater than p. But now, what we do in a more naive way, we just uh, multiply x inverse in the left hand side because that's uh, what we could do to solve the linear equation. Till here, x inverse still means man -pers man um, more parallel inverse. And by verifying the definition, one can find that also give you that term, and then you arrive at a similar uh, estimator. So we can understand this optimal least square from the two different uh, point of view. So 
I don't think it will have this. So if it's not that, then it can't be a least squared solution. But, but you know, this term, I, at least it is, so I don't know whether this equivalent should be. So I mean, unbiased, you. So you so you have like you have more degree of freedom for the parameters, right? So you can just change from. Okay, let's continue. So that's also one problem for the high-dimensional case because you don't have a unique solution. Okay, this is a, so then we come to the, our, the conditions for my, the assumption condition I theorem on for my least optimal least square estimator. So first, it's the same, uh, dimensional assumption where psi will be specified later, whether it's greater or less than one. So here, there are two things different from the uh, SIS. First, Z doesn't, so for SIS, it requires the, all the submatrix of Z to have the concentration property. But now we don't need that strong. We just need the Z itself to satisfy the concentration property. So there's nothing to do with the submatrix of Z. And second, we remove the strong condition between the true variables and the Y. So a marginal correlation between true variables and Y. We remove that condition. So these values are similar, very similar to the Paper, we just use them to control. This controls the speed, the rate of beta k to zero. This controls the speed of sigma goes to sing singular. So, so this arrived, uh, here comes our first theorem. So we use a similar strategy to as best as the so we pick a shrinkage factor delta less than one, and for one step we just choose a model with only delta p variables according to our beta, our estimated beta. We just order the beta and choose the largest delta p and uh, choose it as our, uh, our, as our selected model. Then for this theorem, is that what with all the three conditions hold before here, and if these two cover are positive and one, then we, and we also choose the shrink factor follow this equation. This actually gives a lower bound for this data. We cannot choose it too small. Then we will have our selected model contain the true model with the overweighting prob probability. If it goes to one exponentially fast with the, uh, this is exponential time. So this is a cause of one step accuracy. Uh, it doesn't uh, put any restriction on Kasai. But the problem is that for the selected well, since there is a lower bound on this delta, so the selected model is still in the same order of p. It doesn't really reduce the dimension. But in reality, when p is not large enough, the I mean, is not very very high, the one step accuracy is enough to use. So the MS is true model. Yes, true model. I'm sorry. And so the M delta could, it, be, could contain more variables than the. Yes, yes, you're right. Yeah, that's the case. So yeah, the, this one is problematic because there are some mistakes with fans paper. So I'm going to skip. So I would say our original idea is so since you for one step, if you can prove the one step accuracy, then I can do the this step sequentially in in a suitable number of steps. I I have to choose this step very carefully to make it not larger than this exponential. Then I can just uh, mount them together. It will still then I will try to, like, for example, if it's 2k times, then you can reduce your model size down to n. And if you choose this k, to choose this k uh, in a proper way, it will still give you, a, uh, give you a good probability. But there are some problems, and we just skip it. So then we arrive at our main result for the theory. So in this case, we put, a, put some strong restriction on the size where the size should be less than one. And we will achieve the so-called rank consistency result. So here we plug in the size to the original uh, restriction equation. Then we will arrive at this result, which means that all the beta i's for the true variables will larger than the 
uh, rest, which means that uh, if you look at the beta i and they're ordered it according to the magnitude from the large to small, then your true variables will always will always live in the largest s beta i, which means that uh, in other words, uh, the zero and the non-zero proof is separable by some threshold value, so largest and the rest with a very large probability. Then in this case, if you select a model MD with D greater than X and less than, then this model will contain the true model with uh, a large probability, which goes to one exponentially. As in any, um, so for example, if we can es estimate this X as impossibly correct, then we can just uh, choose the uh, uh, first largest S variables from our estimated beta, then it could it, is, it contains the true model with a very very large problem. So this is the main theorem of the of my of the optimal least square. Okay, so in this section, I'm going to give our uh, naive comparison between SIS and all else. So why SIS fails, why all else works, and give a brief introduction to the stifle manifold. That's, that's what we used in the proof. So first, recall the definition of SIS. So the marginal correlation equal to S transpose Y. Then if we, if we write Y equal to S beta plus some epsilon, we can actually write this as this form. So for S transpose epsilon, that's a small part. We just ignore that too. So the, uh, the important part is this S transpose X times beta. So we know x transpose x is a p times p matrix. So in the original setting, when p is fixed, we know x transpose x over n will converge to the converse matrix when n is large. But in this case, since p grows with n, this will not converge to the covariance matrix. But if we only look at a finite number of the entries of this x transpose x over n, it still converge, converge to the entries in the sorry, covariance matrix. Right? If we just look at the finite numbers, not the whole matrix. So here, just assume our true parameter are all here, and these are all zero. Now, we look at the correlation between the true variable and the y. It's just the, the gray part multiplied by this red part. So because this matrix times this will, will be zero. So if, if we, therefore, we can write the w1, for example, the first row. The estimate can be right as, for example, if we um, standardize our x, then this will be, uh, be the correlation matrix. We can write the form as beta 1 plus row 1i times beta i, which means that the row 1i are all the entries in uh, this part times the corresponding beta i. So if the correlation is high, I mean, if the rows are all zero, we know the beta 1 will sort of will, uh, will definitely stand out. But if the row are not zero and it's a little high, then by choosing some, we can always mutually choose some beta to make it double close to zero. That's why, and the, like most often, we don't need to mutually choose. They will automatically make this W1 very, very small. Uh, that's why SIS fails in many cases. So for our OLS, we also write this Y with equal equal to x beta times epsilon, a plus epsilon, and uh, uh, write it in this form. So this is still the error part. We just uh, ignore it, and uh, this is the important one. So this is a very, I guess it's a familiar form, this x transpose times something. This is actually a projection matrix, and uh, which use the row space of x to capture beta. It's different from the uh, ordinary least square. But it's similar. Then if we can. So we choose this H to be the basis of the row space of X. Then we can write this formula as X as H times H transpose beta. So here H, H is a, so we know each column of H are orthogonal to each other, but it's, a, but it's still a P times N matrix. It's not a totally orthogonal because it only has N columns. So actually H is an element on the stifle manifold. Then we come to a stifle manifold. So the definition of stifle manifold. The first n columns of a p times p orthogonal matrix form the stifle manifold the BMP, right here. So this is a matrix H, which has, has dimension p times n, and follow that H transpose H equal to 
I n, n is smaller than p. So this is just a definition of the Stifle manifold. So there is a natural uniform distribution called a Hall measure on the Stifle manifold. So they call it a uniform distribution in the sense that it is invariant under any orthogonal transformation. You can do any matrix orthogonal transformation on both left and the right hand side of the H. If it follows the uniform distribution, uh, it will not be changed under any orthogonal transformation. Now, based on this knowledge, when this is uh, our condition one of our condition, if they is spherically symmetrically distributed, then we can there is a very nice mathematical form for H. Uh, so for the density function of H can be written in this way. Sigma is the covariance matrix. And uh, with regard to power measure, we can write the density function like this. The, this means the determinant of the matrix. And this one was denoted as the matrix angular central Gaussian distribution. So why there is a Gaussian here is because this distribution origin, originally derived from Gaussian distribution. But actually, it only needs to be symmetric, to, the original distribution to be symmetric. So yeah, the book by Professor Chu is very nice. If you are interested in sample manifold, you should read that book. <laughs> so now, uh, okay, with this nice form, we can then then the H transpose, uh, H times H transpose matrix will behave in a very, very nice way. It will have this form. The diagonal elements will stand out than the rest. So I prove the diagonal elements will be in the n over p order. And the off-diagonal elements will all be in the small n over p. So which is, when n goes to infinity, these parts are all very slow, and the diagonal will like dominated the rest. And I'm not dominant because if you times the p here, you uh, for finite elements, it, for finite numbers of elements, it can dominate it. So if we look at, uh, for example, we look at the magnitude of a, of a true variable, it's just this matrix times this n. And for each of them, there is only one uh, diagonal element times the non-zero beta. And all the other non-zero beta will be multiplied by the small n part, which will, damage, which will vanish by n goes to infinity. So, so for the true variables, they will, they will be in the order of n over p. This is a big O. Now for the non-zero non part, oh sorry, for the zero part, each term, each row multiplied by this n, all of them are small, small n. That's in the <coughs> order of small o n. Then if we if you times a beta here, it will still give you, if we take that, it will still give you a uh, small o n part. So finally, your true variable, the estimate of your true variable will be greater than the uh, zero, zero variables. That's why our method, our, our, our theorem will work to select the true variable just by looking at the magnitude, just by order the betas. OK, now I'm going to demonstrate some sort of simulation study. Mm, yeah. Is this a, is the most exciting part. OK, so first, OK, so the simulation will be conducted in, in two stages. First is we just look at the screening accuracy. Accuracy, like, like uh, what's, the probability, what's the probability to choose the uh, true model? And uh, for second step, we are going to use the two-stage reflection to see how well we can improve the original method uh, by pre-selecting our uh, by pre-selecting the variables using our method. Then last, we can see some extreme cases. So first, uh, this model in this case we have p equal to 1,000 s equal to 500. Oh, sorry, s equal to five. There is only five variables, so the coefficient is set to two, but with sign change. Some and the epsilon follows the zero one, x follows follows a multi multi normal, multi variable normal. And the variance of x I fixed at one. The row the cor correlation was all constant, but was a fixed as a constant, and the sign was random choose. Uh, so we simulated we simulated the data set five hundred times and uh, uh, summarized as a result. This this table contains the minimal final size 
we all have two selected in order to contain the true model x. So for example, I can look, because I know the true variables, so that I look at how small I can choose in order, the smallest the smaller I can choose in order to capture the true model. So we see when real equal to zero, this, con this corresponds to the independent case. So in this case, SIS also do very well. The, uh, this part is the, sorry, so this number is the median of the, uh, of the minimum size. And this is the standard deviation. So you see, when rho equal to zero, SIS can still have a capture the true model very efficiently. Efficiently. But when rho goes from zero to 0 0.3, um, yeah, almost fails, no matter if it's really fast. But now for OLS, when sample size is small, it still performs well. But if the sample size goes slightly larger to 100, it almost pick the true variables within a very small sample size, a very very small model size. As if it, if it rate, uh, increased to 150, most likely the model, if we only select about uh, 15 variables, even in the correlation equal to 0.9 case, we can still select a true model with very high probability. So I guess this is kind of a verification for the rank consistency theory per property. So here we also list the probability to pick the true model if we at the same time, uh, if we at each round only choose the largest uh, beta hat. For example, for n t equal to 50, we only choose, when we fit the model, we only choose the fifth largest covariance. And for 100, we just choose the largest 100 covariance. So we see still, when rho equal to zero, uh, SIS performs similar to RS. But when rho goes to, uh, when correlation goes higher, SIS almost fails to pick. But the follow us when n to 100, so the probability for you to pick the true model is almost close to 1. And here, for 150, you can, mm, like with probably 1, you pick the true model. Now let's come to the next simulation. In this case, we have the uh, variable is equal to 10,000, and the true variable is 8. So the data set will still remain in the similar order. Now, yeah, all the other similar, but we, this time because it's still slow, so we only simulate 300 data sets. So the performance is similar in, so of the table is similar to the previous one. So like as I do well in row equals zero, but, it, but you see here when n equals to 300, almost, um, almost all else can. So for n equals to 500, so in most cases the two variables are, are, are in the largest eight position, has the largest eight of beta is a very amazing result. So also the probability to pick, so, so yeah, it's similar. But I mean, when p equals to 10,000, it still works very fine. Even your data set is only 300. OK, for next, for next uh, section, we are going to prepare the two-stage selection as estimation accuracy. Here we compare the uh, OLS LACO, which means that we'll see first we do an OLS to select some model, then do LACO on that model. So OLS LACO, OLS ElastiNet, and uh, OLS SCAD with original LACO, ElastiNet, and SCAD. In terms of the operating time, estimation error. Here we use the L2 loss of the uh, L2 loss of estimate beta hat as the estimation error, and the final model size of the model achieves the minimal L2 loss. So for each method, we can we calculate the 500 tuning parameters because for that, so for this kind of param, uh, penalized method, we have to choose the tuning parameter. We choose the, we calculate the 500 and uh, search for the optimal. The method are provided by these two packages. Mm. Okay, so this is a setting for the model. Still, we are, we are looking at the linear model, where x follows the Martin Fair normal, and the epsilon is the same. But here, we change this. It's real not, it's real at this time not fixed at uh, some constant, but uh, randomly picked from negative 0, uh, 0.6 to 0.6. And the beta is also drawn from a, a value which is very close to the noise level. So this is similar to noise, and this. Uh, the small value. So beta i is very close to the noise level. 
Uh, why choose Rajri like this is because um, constant works very well for Lasso. So, <laughs> <laughs> because they have proved that for constant correlation, the irrepresented condition will be satisfied. So that's why I choose that random. Actually, also, also, also works well. So we said we simulated 300 data set for values p equal to 5,000, n equal to 100, s equal to 5, and p equal to 30,000, n equal to 300, s to 8. Uh, s equal to 8. So first, uh, this is a minimal L2 loss for S mini beta. So this is for P equal to 5,000, then this is P for, for P equal to uh, 30,000. So although we see there is only a slight improvement for the uh, estimating error, but I see this is a theoretical estimating error. It may not be achieved in the real data, because, because I know which true beta is. So I can calculate the theoretical minimal L2 loss for these methods. But still, from theoretical view of point, we can still uh, improve the, I mean, this method improves the theoretical uh, estimated error. So here you see the, oh, the scatter here is missing because scatter cannot uh, deal with any vector larger than 1 million bytes. So I cannot calculate for that. And uh, the minimum, uh, the L2 error is, so scatter is out of, Outperform the other two methods for L2 error. That, that is because the property of scatter, because this is unbiased estimator. But for LASO and the SNET, they are biased. So that's why scatter will perform better. But the computation time, I'm sure, the computation time for scatter will be not much higher than the other methods. So this is for the case when P equal to 5,000. So this shows the, oh, that shows the mean time for computing. So you see LASO and the SNET. Uh, Still very okay. So all that is very smaller. But for yeah, in order to achieve that small L error, it, you have to come spend a lot of time for computing. But by using LS, you can still reduce it to a very small time. So this is the median final size for the model we selected. So you see by using LS as a pre screen of uh, as a pre selection, you can. So it's very, uh, we, uh, we can reduce the model size by like nearly half. Yeah. Scatter, as we said before, it's uh, unbiased. So it should, when we are, uh, choose the uh, minimum L2 loss, it should be at the same, I should be choose the, uh, select, it should select the true model. But the computation time is very, very high. So when your sample size, or when your uh, covariance, the dimension is going a slightly larger, we cannot implement here, actually. So this is a case for p equal to 30,000. So there's no scatter here because it cannot compute this time. And uh, similarly, we can uh, so it still achieve the smallest for L as scatter. And uh, the final size is still, so I think this more than half. You reduce the final size selected. And the computer time, computational time is also smaller, much smaller. So I have to argue here. Actually, I, I guess the Professor Hattie, they use some higher level routing for their package. So their, their job net even faster, their last even faster, the algorithm in MATLAB, much faster. So I guess they, they, they must use some higher routing for their uh, algorithm. That's why that. For that, if, if, you use, if you use MATLAB, it should be much higher time you, you cost. OK, finally, yeah, there are some. Finally, let's look at some extreme cases. Now suppose the model, yes, some entertainment. Now suppose the model contains p equal to 100 covariates, but only two of them are important. But unfortunately, we only have two observations. Is it possible for us to throw away any covariates? So we have we have some strategy. But we can just randomly pick about like 50 covariates. Then the probability to pick the true model is around the point 20, one, one, one fourth. So the risk to throw away 50 covariates is about 0.75. Now by using LS, the risk by from the simulation, we can see the risk for throwing away 50 covariates is around 0.3 to 0.4, which is much smaller than, and you have a bag, you have bigger chance to contain the true model by just by throwing 50 covariates. And the one command that the last one is net, net all failed in this case, uh, in this setting. Lasso never detects the true model, and the ElastNet can provide cannot provide a sparse solution. So it means that ElastNet cannot do any variable selection in this setting. But we can still 
this. OK. OK, feel sure work. So in the proof, we only need the, for the proof, we, I only need the moment information on the error part. So it's very easy. So since I, I'm, wor I'm working in a normal framework, but it's easy to get out from because I just put some, if I put some restriction on the epsilon, I can um, generalize my work to generalize a linear model, not just a contained in the normal framework. The second, uh, due to the explanation from the uh, compressed sensing, it's possible to generalize my, my work to the field of compressed sensing. And uh, actually, lots of sensing measures satisfy the conditions, the conditions required by OS. And the John, John's and Linus draft lemma is naturally inferred from the proof of OS. So I don't know the answer, but it seemingly is impossible, but I still list here. Thank you very much. much <laughs> nice time. Hi. Uh, you didn't ever talk about the distribution of the estimator, given that you've selected the ones that are selected. What's the distribution of those beta hats? Do, do you see, for example, do you have the Oracle property that you that converges to the? No, I didn't. I didn't consider the estimation problem. So I only consider the model selection consistency. So whether I choose the true model, not a, my, I don't care about the uh, performance on the estimation part. And then do you, would you recommend estimating using, say, regular OLS, regular or ordinary squares after you have uh, the correct set? I don't know. I have, I have a Because you're going to be hard pressed to beat that if you have the true set, which is what you're claiming. But uh, you know, even by using my method, you can. Yeah, you can. If, for example, if I if I have a data set equal to like 500, in that case, if you can correctly select the from like just a, for example the largest eight covariance, then I can think I think you can use the ordinary least square estimator to do that. But in other case, somehow you still have some probability for your graph to drop out from the eight, for example, to 10, maybe 20. In that case, if you still want to do the shrinkage, you still have to do lasso in order okay. to find the solution, sparse solution. Yes. Because the ordinary square will not provide any sparse solution to that. Because optimally squares <laughs> prove that you're. No, no, no. I just made this name. I, did, I haven't got a nice name for this term, so I just use this one. <laughs> I guess it's the optimal, but I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no criteria, so I just call it optimal. Yeah, Brian suggested GLS for good news squared. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> cool, cool. <laughs> so for the simulation part, you show the you optimal least square plus uh, some shrinkage method, and you mentioned that you can kind of repeat your optimal least square a lot of times. Have you compared? Oh, I didn't re repeat it. I just do one one step selection. This, yes. Yeah, oh, you mean lasso? Yeah, lasso can you can also do lasso once, but first there is no. The there is no theoretical guarantee for you to, so the lasso uh, consistency requirement is that you can only select, uh, uh, select the non zeros as so the con their con consistency was on the. For the most selection, it's on the non-zero part. Like you do lasso, you uh, you can only choose. You can only guarantee it for those non-zeros. But you first, if you want to do first steps through lasso, you have to choose that good lambda, when which will give you a considerable larger uh, model size. For example, if you choose a lambda too large, your sample will, uh, your selected model will be too small for for first step, right? If you choose a lambda too small, you will not efficiently. So your first step is not meaningful because you didn't reduce enough. So you have you have to select you have to search over the lambda to choose a lambda, which gives you um like a reasonable size for your first model. And this is equivalent to directly select for the whole step. I don't know whether. Mm -hmm. The other is OLS plus OLS. Oh, OLS plus OLS. You said you can repeat it still. So what do you mean by repeat it? Repeat the OLS step. You first get a smaller model, then do a smaller, then. So I think for each step, I this model I get is smaller enough. So 
I always only do I only do one step. So there's no theory guarantee for the step after step OS because the theorem is there's some problem with the theorem because the fans find the paper is wrong for that part. So I'm mine is also wrong. <laughs> so I cannot do that. There's no step by step guarantee for LS. But I but if you put some restriction on Kasai you can do one step it's guaranteed. So hi. <laughs> So you replace the condition from SIS, the process condition of the minimum correlation, in this case, so you were right. You replace that condition on the condition number of the covariance matrix. Does the condition oh. number not go to zero as the number? I right? guess it's a uh, different. So in fact, yes, they put. Uh, so this is mine. So I put condition number on sigma. But then if you look at the fans um, condition. They also put they although they only restrict the largest uh, eigenvalue of sigma, but the, since you they can do the transformation on Z, so so intrinsically they assume Z to be non-singular. So I just add a yeah. I just add a um, rate constraint on the on the least uh, eigenvalue. Actually, I don't think this correspond to because correspond to this condition because you see for the formal simulation. For the high correlation case, my method also works, right? So I did so, which means I don't need this correlation actually. Okay. okay. So, it, so it's expected the condition number of these covariance matrix. But if you have covariance matrix or correlation matrix for everything in point nine, I'm expecting the condition number to go to zero. Or to go to point nine. So from the um, so I, I actually I just want to make the proof easier. So. Uh, actually, this con this condition could be reduced, uh, be relaxed, in because if you look at the uh, matrix, like you fix all the correlation to 0.95, although the largest eigenvalue goes very high, but the, uh, but the most of the eigenvalues will be constrained in a small range, like from probably from the 0 0.9, 0 0.9 to 1.1, 1 .1, uh, except for just a very small number of the eigenvalues that goes away from that. So. Very uh, possibly, my method will work for when for the condition number is not good, but if it still satisfies that most of the eigenvalues was constrained in some range, my method still works. So that in that case, I don't need to put a strong uh, assumption on the condition condition number of the covariance matrix. But that will be you take much more step for the proof, which is very, you know, it's. For put that construction will be easier for you to prove everything. So the rest of your eigenvalues you're sitting very close to one, and your condition on the condition number is basically the same as the condition on the eigenvalue. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you said most of the eigenvalues are sitting very close to one. Yeah. So this requirement on the condition number is basically the same as the requirement on the largest eigenvalue. I know. It's, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's the least. Of, Least eigenvalue will still go to there. The largest will go to very high, but the middle part will still stay stay in some part. Okay, so so actually, that's what actually that's what we need actually. In, goes faster, yeah, sure, it must be faster. But it still grows with n. So I, I think in fact, case they cannot work. So, they, so probably this condition number could also be inferred from their condition three, like the correlation. I'm not very sure, but probably they have some. I have to add it to make the proof simpler. <laughs> so what if you uh, can you repeat this but by using uh, other OLS estimates? So since OLS is a PD, uh -huh. you use something like that uh, to estimate based on that. So mine is just as a is the same as the pan more pyros. Oh yes, it'd be the same. Yes, it's the same because I have Derive here if you so here you see the more parents is similar. So just another form of the more parents. Okay, so this is exactly the same. Yeah. But okay. for this estimator it's hard to deal with because if you want to use some matrix like large matrix random matrix theory, it's hard to deal with the journal inverse. I think there is no theory to deal with the this more parents inverse for large random matrix. So but for this form it's easy because you can have a third form. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay.
Let's thank Tim. Oh, what should I do? Click on the in broadcast. Oh, sorry, you should. Oh, sorry.